equalism uh, are, are still dry, well, we'll keep going. <laughs> Unfortunate that's happened here. Among, I, I was thinking I was coming in, I was going to name all, all of Richard's many accomplishments, and now to that we add, uh, you know, shows up to give a colloquium on a day when his office has been flooded. So, <laughs> among the many uh, positive awards, uh, that's, that's a positive thing you're giving back. Um, I, I uh, usually like to give very short introductions because I want to leave time for the speaker. It uh, doesn't mean I don't want to leave time for Richard to talk, but if I gave him too short an introduction, it wouldn't do justice to uh, all the uh, amazement and good feelings I have for him uh, over a career, a shorter one mine, an incredibly great one his. Um, Richard is a seeker of knowledge. He has been a star in every field uh, he has gone into. This is just off the top of my head. Um, you know, he's a winner of the prestigious Lazarus Feld Award in sociology. Uh, okay, I, bet, I hope I don't get this wrong, but they are a fellow of the American Statistical Association, similar for uh, uh, societies and criminologies, chaired our Department of Criminology. He's been a fantastic um, leader in the science of policy evaluation for years and years. He had an uh, evaluation review. Um, I think back uh, to the papers you guys did with uh, Lenahan and Rossi in the American Sociological Review and the American Journal of Sociology, which at the time were incredibly rare in the social sciences because they were field studies uh, that involved randomized trials and uh, questions about the analysis of the information uh, raise these fundamental questions about you know, the meaning of what are now, I guess, called mediation analysis or some nonsense like that, but were the old intervening variables. Uh, and uh, you know, intellectually, personally, it started me on an interest in uh, uh, causation in the social sciences that uh, I managed to keep going until fairly recently. Uh, and uh, you know, that, that's a kind of uh, wonderful intellectual treat. Um, I was trying to think, Richard, I think we met. Uh, the, the point here was is that Richard is always looking for new ideas. I think we met in Colorado when you were chairing the forecasting. Uh, there was something the Social Science Research Council was doing on forecasting, but Richard had them doing it as well with meteorologists, climate scientists, before climate science was cool. Uh, and, um, you know, it was really interesting what we learned. I think we learned an impossibility theorem about weather forecasting from the physicists that proved false. Uh, but, you know, that's how it goes in science. So it's true today, uh, maybe um, um, different uh, tomorrow. Um, the work that Richard is uh, talking about uh, today goes to something that, um, uh, you know, I think is, uh, you know, like everything, he's been ahead of, ahead of the times. He's been working on what's variously called uh, machine learning, uh, data mining, big data, and so on for many, many years. Among his many textbooks is a very accessible one uh, on the subject. Uh, when Richard and I were corresponding about this presentation, he said, I don't know, is this kind of stuff of interest in demographers? And I think what I wrote back is, I don't know whether it is, but it ought to be. And the reason I say that is the following one. Um, I'm often in meetings with demographers where demographers feel a little disgruntled because they always think, hey, we were the ones with big data. And now, of course, big data is everywhere or are everywhere. And we as demographers sometimes feel dispossessed. Uh, but what I urge us to do is to get over our feelings uh, and do a little bit of learning. Uh, maybe learning not like machines, because machines tend to do things automatically. And the kind of automaticness that, that, that those of us in the population field do is related, you know, I think, toward our statistical dispositions. We've always had a lot of data that's permitted us to do things with, um, you know, what are essentially generalized linear models. As we got more and more data, we liked having hierarchical models. We could do all kinds of things. And that's the association we've had with big data. Better precision about things that are now parameterized at more and more levels. 
But from the very beginning, when I started reading Richard's work on big data, he uses it for some really weird things from a population standpoint, like trying to find rare but important events. Uh, and it's a totally different way to think about big data, at least relative to what we do. So anyhow, I don't think anybody came here to hear me prattle on. I'm going to turn it over to Richard, but it's my sincere appreciation to have you here. Thank you. Thanks, sir. That was a very kind. Uh, there's no way I can live up to it. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, strange. Um, and let me start out with an important distinction. I'm assuming uh, probably nobody, maybe one or two, know much about machine learning. Um, so let me start out with a very important distinction to avoid some confusion that is no doubt. There's going to be some confusion anyway, but a major confusion. Models are different from algorithms. Okay? When you have a model, you're trying to represent how nature produces the data that you see. It's a generative model. And from that, if your model is reasonably good, you can do statistical inference on all kinds of things. Algorithms are different. When you balance your checkbook, you're applying an algorithm. When you compute a mean, algorithm, those are not models. When you balance your checkbook, it's nothing to do with how nature produced whatever your net gains or losses were for that month, but it's a way of arriving at a number that's useful. Um, I've been working with algorithms in the form of machine learning for 30 years, and I'm commonly using it to forecast. Congratulations. Congratulations. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Um, I've been doing this for a while, and the major applications of any in forecasting, or the question is, before a criminal justice decision maker decides to do something with a particular offender, like release them on parole or incarcerate them in a prison, it's important that the decision be informed by some forecast of how the individual will behave. And that's been done informally in the United States since the 1920s. Over time, the data has gotten bigger. Over time, clinical judgment has been replaced by statistical tools. And over time, cross tabs and regressions are being replaced by machine learning. So I've been at this for a while. I get into this problem, however, um, thanks to a phone call. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of consternation in Washington about mass shootings. Um, why that is is a whole other sociological problem, but you can imagine that there's that point of concern. And um, the Justice Department contacted NSF and said, what are you all doing about mass shootings? And the answer was nothing. And of course, that was not an acceptable response. And so uh, some very entrepreneurial types, Dan Nagin being one, was working with NSF on a variety of issues and suggested that they put together a gathering, a workshop, which was last week, on mass shootings. Um, I've never worked on mass shootings. Dan gave me a call and said, we have an interesting problem for you. Mass shootings are very, very rare. Can you forecast them? And both of us sort of laughed and agreed that probably not. But um, never being one to shrink from a challenge, I said, OK, I'll write a paper on this. Um, I may conclude that nothing can be done, but it gives me some incentive to try some new tools. So that's what this paper is about. Um, it involves sort of a illustration of why logistic regression is silly in this case, maybe silly generally. Um, but even standard machine learning tools stumble because of the rare events issue, which I'll be more explicit about. And so I um, started fooling around with other algorithm approaches, which I'm very fascinated with, genetic algorithms, which are basically code which essentially tries to capture some of the spirit of natural selection. So. In this role, what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct the end a set of hypothetical, real nasty people that don't exist, at least exactly as we have them. But we're going to learn a lot anyway. So um, this picture is kind of a symbol of where I'm the guy in the white coat, by the way. My students think I'm the guy on the gurney. Um, but we're going to play Dr. Frankenstein here. And I'm going to take you on a little journey until we get to that point. Um, my guess is most of the tools are unfamiliar. Um, I'm happy to stop and try to be more explicit. You can't obviously, I'm right in the middle of a course this spring teaching this stuff. Um, I can't do it in five minutes, but I certainly can try to provide some intuitions about what we're doing. If you just remember that the game is algorithms, 
not models, um, I think that would help a lot. So, what's the problem? Um, so if you're going to predict mass violence, probably want to start with a definition. And we, were, we had our workshop for two days. And the first day and more, we spent arguing about what a good definition was. The official FBI definition is a homicide with four or more deaths in 24 hours by the same person. Three doesn't count. Four attempts that are not successful don't count. And there was a big debate about that. But for now, that's not really my concern, because the point I'm going to make is about rare events in general. Um, they are rare, and for reasons I'll explain shortly, very hard to analyze, but they're also very heterogeneous. You can have shootings in schools. You can have shootings at rock concerts. You can have shootings where we call it familicide, where whole families are killed. Um, you can have shootings at armed robberies where all witnesses are executed. They're all very different. One of the problems with really dealing with this mass violence issue is that it's treated as a conglomeration of very heterogeneous events. And a sociologist democracy, you can immediately intuit that the things that are associated with those rare events are going to differ. A shooting that occurs subsequent to some domestic violence event is different than climbing up into a tall hotel room and shooting a bunch of people at a rock concert. So they're heterogeneous and they're rare, and that creates unusually difficult problems. In the first case, you're comparing apples to oranges. You've already probably intuited that. And it's really clear also that you've got to figure out what's in the denominator. If you take school shootings, am I worried about the probability that a given school will experience a mass shooting? Or am I worried about whether a given student will be shot in a mass shooting? Different, different models, different issues. And that was the other thing that was debated at the great length of no resolution. Uh, we had a lot of law enforcement types there. The FBI was there. Homeland Security was there, Secret Service. Some very smart people, they may have been the smartest people in the room, as a matter of fact. And uh, they had their organizational reasons for defining things in certain ways. But even they weren't sure this was a good way to handle it. Anyway, there are many different ways to go. And the low base rate problem means, of course, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. And our statistical tools that are conventionally available, even machine learning, don't do that very well for reasons I'll show you in just a moment. What do I mean by low base rate? If you have a binary outcome, what it means is that the red cases are just unusual. You might have something like a 99, 1% split on some binary variable, where 1% represents the mass shootings, and the 99% represent something in the denominator. But you can also have rare events at the tails of distributions. So um, we shoot people all the time in this country. Um, I'm sure there will be 20 or 30 today. Um, the question is, when we shoot people, do we shoot a lot of them? And at that question, we wind up at the tail of the distribution. Four or more, again, I told you, is the definition that's used. That's very rare. Um, we maybe have the FBI, uh, I think they're quite reasonable in this. They were saying that they get about three or four tips a day, which they run down pretty well, and they were able to prevent a lot of mass shootings. Um, but that may only mean five to 10 successful mass shootings per year. And they're going to be in heterogeneous settings. So when I refer to rare events, I could be talking about binary things that are happening rarely or the tails of a distribution. Now, let me give you a little story to sort of underscore this. Um, I you know, lived in California for about 30 years before I moved here, 12 years ago. And where I lived in California, up in the Hollywood Hills, um, we were visited all the time by wild animals. The coyotes basically owned the neighborhood. They would walk down the street as if they owned it. Um, there were, of course, raccoons, deer, and an occasional bear. And among the many things that meant you had to do, it meant when you put out your garbage, it had to be in a pretty strong container that a strong animal like a bear couldn't get in. So when we moved to Philadelphia, one of my first questions, I lived fairly near Fairmont Park, and there's some wildlife there. And one of the first questions I asked was, well, when I put out my garbage once a week, do I have to be careful about bears? Everybody laughed. Bears in Philadelphia? No way. And for 10 years, that's 500 observations, they were absolutely right. And one morning, I put out my garbage, and I had a visitor. It's a pretty friendly bear. <laughs> um, but I'm very interested in my garbage. Now, bear didn't create any other problems snacked a little bit, 
wandered off into the woods and swam across the Wissahickon Creek off to the northern suburbs and into further areas west where I'm sure you would find sheep, lots of companions. So this is a rare event. Before, if I'm standing here today, um, my garbage goes out tomorrow. Standing here today, if you ask me the probability that a bear will get into my garbage, I'll say no, but I'll be right 0.999, right? 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm right. How can a statistical tool be more accurate than that? I don't need any predictors. I know for sure, almost, that I'm not going to have to worry about bears. But it turns out that because bears are taken to be really important if you care about the garbage, um, I got to do something to forecast them. I mean, that's the way mass violence is. It's extremely rare. If I always forecast no mass, take Penn, a mass shooting at Penn. If I predict every day no mass shooting, perhaps I'll always be right. But even if I'm wrong once or twice, the probability of being, of being right is very, very high. So that's basically the problem, one of the problems with rare events. The first is, as I said at the bottom here, excellent but trivial. I can forecast my garbage is safe with almost certainty. And I can't really do very much better than that, but you'll all agree it's kind of a trivial forecast. Likewise with mass shootings, I can say 10 every day is going to be safe, almost certainly. And you'll say, wait a minute, that's, yeah, I'm sure it's rare, but I don't care. I want to know about the rare event when there is a shooting. And of course, the Penn police worries about that with that stuff. The second problem is that when I have rare events and they actually occur, I have very little information. My bear, for example, could have been taking my garbage because it was a young bear, bear could have been a sick bear, could have been a lost bear, could have been a bear that's eaten garbage before and developed a taste for it, could have been an injured bear. There's all kinds of explanations, but with one bear and five predictors, no way I'm going to get anywhere. Even if there were five or six bears, the amount of information I can extract from these rare events to understand something about when things are going to occur is very limited. So I have those two problems, lack of information and very accurate but trivial forecasts. So that's what we're going to explore with respect to mass violence. Well, I already talked about the fact that mass violence is very heterogeneous. So I'm going to narrow the scope of what's in my denominator. It turns out that the most common form of mass violence involves domestic violence. It's about 40% of the mass shooting. Some, there's a the family with a history of domestic violence. The perpetrator, virtually always a man, finally one day takes out a gun, shoots his wife, shoots his kids, shoots her parents, and then maybe commits suicide. That's sort of the prototype, that sort of thing. It's very rare, but it is the most common form of mass violence, at least in the United States. So I'm going to focus on that. Now, thankfully, in Philadelphia, we have not had a mass shooting involving domestic violence as long as I've been here. We have, in fact, very few homicides that are related to domestic violence each year, under, under 10. Um, they're all tragic, but they're rare, given that we have approximately 35,000 domestic violence incidents reported to the police each year. Five or 10 homicides is very, very small. So that's even beyond what I can have the ambition to consider. So I'm going to consider something that may be a precursor. I'm going to look at domestic violence incidents in which there are injuries. Those are very rare, too. They're about 5% of all the domestic violence cases reported to the police. So what I'm going to do, as I just said, is I've defined a set of trials. A trial is a domestic violence incident. And the standard way we handle that machine learning is we're going to weight up those rare events so that they have more impact on the fitted values that we get. Be real clear, we're not adding information. It's not as if we have a richer story. We're just allowing the algorithm to perform better. But it's not as if we learn a whole lot. If I only have three bears, treating them as if they're 15 doesn't really add more information. It just allows my algorithm to work a little better. So you don't want to kid yourself and think you're manufacturing more data than you're not. And then what I'm going to do, I'm sure that doesn't work, although it beats the hell out of logistic regression. I'm going to curate and study what I call the Frankensteinian population of very, very nasty IPD perpetrators. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grow a population of perpetrators with this algorithm who are very rare using analogies to natural selection. Then I'm going to look for commonalities among these perpetrators. 
once I find those commonalities, I'll show you what they are and think of those maybe as risk factors. And then I'm going to show you how you can compute how important those risk factors are in determining the risk that a given individual provides. So let's get going. The data. Um, and we're using data from 2013. Um, I'm going to focus on IPV cases and partner violence. That's a subset of domestic. Domestic violence can be, for example, um, two brothers fighting. So these are IPV cases. This is all the cases in 2013. There are about 22,000 perpetrators. The way the data are organized is we have an initial incident in which the police are called. The police arrive at the scene, collect the information. From that, we follow the perpetrators subsequently for up to a year, and we see who reoffends. So with 35,000 cases, about 22,000 perpetrators. 20% of those perpetrators are reported to have another incident of domestic violence that year, but only 5%, 5% are reported in which the victim is injured. So that's our rare event, 5%. Uh, it can get a lot rarer, but I wanted to start out with something that I thought might just work. So I have the same problems I had before. I have a relatively small number of incidents on which, from which to learn things. And if I don't use any predictors at all, I'm right 95% of the time. If you want to think about variance explained, I'm explaining almost all the variance out of the game. I don't need predictors. How am I going to do better than that? Well, the standard go-to tool, I don't care what the social science is doing, is logistic regression. Here are the kinds of variables you might use. I should stress that these variables come from a special form that the Philadelphia Police Department uses that Professor Sorensen and some others, but particularly Professor Sorensen, helped them design. It's a two-sided form. It's got all kinds of possible variables that could be predictors no one's ever looked at before. For example, we have body maps where the officers mark where the injuries are. So we have a very rich set of predictors gives me a little bit of hope that even with the 5%, we might find some things. But if you look at these, you probably have priors about what they're likely to do. Younger people are more likely to be, for example, victimized and victimizers, although that's tricky because the average age of offenders of domestic violence is a little older, 35, 40, not 20. But these are the sort of things which we're working from. I should add that the police love this. They've been using it for four years. What we really love to do is prosecute because they have all kinds of information that they didn't have previously. Okay, so I applied logistic regression, and you can see that the largest probability of reoffending with injuries is about 0.25. That is, none of the offenders were predicted to reoffend, although 5% did. Most of the pro predicted probabilities were less than 0.05. Obviously, this is a catastrophic failure. We know 5% fail. We don't find any of them. Or not even close. It's not surprising, though, from what I said. We have 95% accuracy, and this just reproduced my 95% accuracy, showing that none of my predictors help at all, which I kind of was worried about when I started, because it was 95 by split. So what do we do? We consider reweighting the data and applying one of my more favorite uh, algorithms, uh, stochastic gradient boosting. Um, I'm just going to give you a sense of what it does. I have a big slide with all the details if anybody wants to do it in more detail. But let me just give you the essence of what boosting does. It's called boosting because what it does is it takes a weak classifier, that is, a procedure which assigns classes, reoffend, not offend, cases. Okay? It takes those which are weak in the sense they don't get it right, like this logistic regression, and boosts them so in a collective of a thousand such runs, you do much better. Okay. How does it do that? Imagine a regression, keep it simple, you have a numeric Y, you get a fitted value, and then you have a residual. Some residuals are big, some residuals are small. Intuition says the bigger the residual, the worse I can fit in that case. The smaller the residual, the better I do. So I'm going to use those residuals to reweight the data. The cases that I fit poorly, I'm going to weight more heavily. Faces, the cases I fit well, I'm not going to weight more heavily. I run the same classifier again. Could be regular regression, logistic regression, discriminant function, whatever you like. 
So now I have a second pass through the data in which I instruct my algorithm to work really hard on the cases I did poorly on the first time, but I'm not done. I repeat that process again because, again, some cases I'm going to fit better than others. I have the residuals, I use them as weights, and I reestimate. I do that a thousand times. I have a thousand set of fit values, each one increasingly trying to find those cases which I didn't classify or didn't fit very well. Take those thousand and combine them. And how you combine is not a big deal, but it's a couple of steps that are really not essential to what I'm trying to explain. So it's a really good tool. Um, boosting is, for the kinds of problems we're talking about, about as good as it gets. There's a lot of tuning you have to do, but it's a very powerful algorithm, um, particularly when you build in some of the details. Oh, no, but I, unless you want to go through a complicated slide, I'm not going to do it. So that's what I'm going to do. There's the algorithm. Okay, so at the end, I get what's called a confusion table, which is a cross tabulation of the actual outcome and the fitted outcome. Now, I've circled the 0.05. Um, I should mention that that's, those are the cases where there really were no injuries, and I forecasted no injuries, and I'm wrong only 5% of the time. Actually, I put 0.04 because I rounded it. It's about 0.045 compared to the, what we had before, which was a little more than five. So I'm doing a little better, but not dramatically so. But again, if I'm already 95% correct, how am I going to do much better? I do a little better. And if you have questions later, I can unpack this table for you. It's a standard diffusion table. There's lots of information here. But for right now, what I want to point out is, even with those wonderful predictors, even with weighting the data, I only do a little bit better. Moreover, when I try to pull out what predictors matter. I don't do very well because they don't do very well. Below, I have a distribution of the boosted probability. Remember, for logistic regression, nothing was higher than 0.5. I got a pretty good distribution now. Okay. I have a substantial number of fitted values greater than 0.5, which means I would classify them as failures. That's a dramatic improvement. I had some 0.6, 0.7. Logistic regression cannot do that. Okay. The boosting does. The problem is that a lot of those forecasted failures are actually false positives. I can cycle back to that. But the point is, the boosting does better, but it's still unsatisfactory for the same problem, which is, how are predictors going to show their importance if I can't predict much better? So we're going to switch our methods. We're going to use the cold genetic algorithm. Again, I'll just give you a cartoon version uh, based on just think natural selection here in the ballpark. So I'm going to start out with 500 individuals. For each of those individuals, I'm going to have all of my predictors. I'm going to code them, just for simplicity, as binary variables. Think of them as genes that are flipped, switched on, or switched off. Under 30, switched on, switched off. Prior DV cases, switched on, switched off. Police make an arrest, switch on, switch off. Okay? I'm going to start out arbitrarily fixing those at ones and zeros. Think of those genes being switched on or switched off. I'm going to run those 500 cases through the results from my boosting algorithm and get a probability that they will reoffend. By the way, I'm reoffending again subsequent to the first visit. So there's no causal direction problems. So some of them are going to be predicted to have a high probability of failure, some are going to be predicted to have not a high probability of failure. In genetic algorithm terms, natural selection, that's a fitness function. Sort of somewhat, um, somewhat unfortunate way we're going to call those more likely to reoffend more fit. That's our fitness function. Now I've got these individuals with their fitness computed. I'm going to sample with replacement from the 500, oversampling those that are more fit. So now I have a new population of 500, but overrepresenting compared to where I started those who are bad guys. But I'm not done. I'm going to mutate some of those binary variables by randomly flipping some of the ones to zeros and some of the zeros to ones. I'm also going to swap genetic content or swap variables between random pairs. Not that often, once in a while. So in this particular case here, I show two random cases, case A and case B. I swap case B's variable values with those of case A. That's sexual reproduction, in case you didn't notice. 
Okay. So now I have in my 500 individuals changes in their predictor values in their genetic code. I've changed it randomly. I run them back through my fitness function, find out those that are most fit. For each, I have a score. I, again, oversample for those sample proportional basically to fitness. I have now a third population that even has more bad guys in it. And then I can do the mutations again and again and again. It turns out, in this application, after about 20 populations, I get as nasty a group as I can get. Um, I ran it 100 times, it doesn't get any nastier. Uh, that's partly a function of my fitness function, which I'd like to have stronger, but it works, you'll see, pretty well as is. Yeah. Can I just ask you one question? When you randomly um, flip from one to zero, is it in function of the margins of the underlying variable? No. Okay, no. So, a, you know, so, my, so my 30 year old is now over 30. Right, but I mean, but but in other words, there's some variables that are comparatively rare, just like the dependent variable, and some variables that are absolutely, that, that, um, and and so each one has the same chance of flopping status. Right, it's like your genetic code and gamma rays. You know, some of your genes are more or less important, and with other people more or less common. But we're going to let a gamma ray pop one of your. Regardless of, regardless of, regardless of the population. Right. Well, remember, we have a distribution here that's no longer where we started. We have some artificial population of real bad guys. These you might see in a thousand cases, you might see two or three of them, which should be rare. Okay. So, this is our population. We have our monsters. And you can see that their probability of failure is universally quite high. Nothing is less than 0.5. They all fail. They all repeat, hypothetically, um, because they had high, very high probabilities. Um, and some of the probabilities, most of them cluster above 0.7. So this is a simulation of a population of very high risk offenders. It's not constructed out of whole cloth. Our risk function is based on data. We're just fiddling around with the predictors given our survival or our risk or our fitness function, given that we're fiddling around with our predictors to find out what would a really bad guy look like. And just so we can analyze it, we can start to find that good out of 1,000, good out of 10. That's a tuning parameter, but 500 turns out to give us something we can work with. Okay, that's what I have now. Now this is a real messy table, not messy, it's just a lot of complicated details, and I don't want to dwell on most of the questions. I want to focus, whoops, I want to focus on the column which says commonality importance. So we have these 500 bad guys. What do they have in common? Well, a very simple arithmetic way to do that is to look across all predictors and find those predictors for those predictors that proportion of times they're flipped one way or the other. So are they all under 30? Were they all arrested? Do all have prior DV incidents? And we report that in the commonality importance. One means 100% of our 500 individuals had this particular feature of their background flipped on. Zero means never. Uh, the, the top one is, um, it just is a length of the follow-up period. It's in there as a sanity check. If that didn't work, I'd be in deep trouble. It says the longer the follow-up, the more likely you fail. If that hadn't worked, I wouldn't be giving this thought. So let's look beneath that. 100% of these 500 had a previous TV incident. 0% were polite when the police arrived. Okay? And we can go on down. 0% are currently married. That actually replicates a common finding, that women are most at risk not when they're married, although they can be at substantial risk then too, but usually when the, after the relationship is broken up or when they're dating, beginning and the end. Um, 100% of the time, the victim reports to the police that she's frightened, and so on down the list. Children are present 100% of the time. The offender is strangled 100% of the time. Most of these variables aren't 100% or 0% they're in between. And an interesting question is whether some of those others could be useful too. I want to keep it simple. I'm going to focus on those predictors for these real bad guys that either 100% flipped on, 100% flipped off. So they are universally shared, that's why I call them commonalities. 
universally shared. The first column was what you get for stochastic gradient boosting. It's mostly different, but again, that's a different story. I can go into it. So you can take those and just for purposes of display, cluster them. Uh, computer scientists are very uh, entrepreneurial, uh, and so they rename things as if they invented them. Uh, this is called unsupervised learning. This was invented in the 1930s. Um, they call principal components unsupervised learning too. That was invented by Carl Pearson in 1901. That's a whole other set of stories. But this is just standard clustering. It is an algorithm. There's no model. If you look at the lower left, those are all the predictors that were coded 100% turned on. Okay? These are the risk factors when switched on. And it's just a way of showing you what you could have extracted from that complicated table. It's nice to see a clustering algorithm reproduce what, if you look hard, you would see. The other on the lower right, currently married and so forth, those are all turned off universally. Now, the weapons thing is kind of curious. There are no weapons. None of these folks use weapons. Because that doesn't sound right. She was injured, wasn't she? Well, that kind of represents misunderstanding of intimate partner violence. Uh, intimate partner violence is about domination. Couples having an argument, perpetrator pulls out a gun, the argument is over. No need to beat up anybody. He gets subservience right there. If you don't have a gun or don't have a weapon, now the argument proceeds. There's kicking, there's strangling, there's throwing out on the floor, there's punching, now there are injuries. So we have this ironic result that if the police, and we have a couple papers showing this, if police remove weapons from the home, handguns in particular, you'd ever say, oh boy, no more violence, uh-uh. There are fewer fatalities, but they're rare. There are many more women who are injured because the dominance has to be introduced physically with hands and fists. So this is consistent. None of these real bad, you know, bad guys had a weapon. And yet, virtually all of the victims were injured. And they did that hands and feet, whatever it is. Okay? So this is consistent with what we know. Now, can we capture how important these variables are? Well, we had to do a little bit of very simple invention here. There is an average probability of reoffending in which the victim is injured of 0.718. That was on the far right of that histogram I showed you. What we can do for each of our predictors that we've selected because they are universal is we can flip either from a 1 to a 0, from a 0 to a 1. Some people call that reverse coding. And see how much worse, how much lower our predicted probability Reoffending injuries is. So, in the first case, I'm going to skip again the follow up period. That's gangbusters. If the follow up period is short, the probability of reoffending with injuries drops from 0.72 to 0.33. Again, it's a sanity check. If it hadn't been that way, again, I wouldn't be doing this talk. Okay, prior domestic violence. We've swapped it from a 1 to a 0 because you remember all of these individuals had in their predictors been reported for domestic violence, that means to the police. We now turn them into no reports of domestic violence, and the risk drops from about 10 probability points to about 0.72 to 0.61. It's pretty important. And we can go down all the variables. Some of them matter quite a bit. For example, prior DV. In contrast, for example, um, whether um, there was a, let's pick, uh, when the victim was under 30, is that the one I'm telling you? Yeah, victim under 30 almost drops none at all from 0.718 to 0.712. I mentioned before the reason for that a lot of domestic violence, unlike street crime, which peaks late teens, early 20s, and pretty much disappears by 30 or so. Domestic violence has that pattern and then grows again around 35 or 40 up to age 50. And so this is again not surprising. I should perhaps use another indicator variable for reporting or something. Okay? So we now have, for these hypothetical offenders, we have risk factors. We know the direction of the risk. We know the size of the effect on their risk. What do we do now? Well, at this point, we stop. Because it's the first time out of the gate for this. I don't know if it's nonsense or not. It seems to make sense. I presented it last week in Washington. 
everybody seemed to go for it. We were starting to talk about doing this for other kinds of mass violence. But be real clear, this is a hypothetical population of offenders. It turns out that while a lot of real offenders have profiles that are somewhat or quite a bit like our population of 500, none of them have that high profile with all the things flipped on or flipped off. So we've sort of extrapolated from the worst to the worst of the worst, the hypothetical population, based on a logic of simply trying to call the most high-risk offenders by changing the variables and changing the values of the variables. So in an ideal world, if these work, I'm on my way to a risk instrument. I can give this to a police officer working with Philly PD, as I said, give this to a checklist to a police officer, comes to the scene, check all eight, if they all check all eight, says, you're going to be back here again, and there's going to be injuries. And that, of course, will affect the chances that the police will make an arrest. And we can be fancier. We can weight them by these declines in risk probability. Other things we can do, too. But it all depends on whether this is a sensible approach conceptually. No model, by the way, right? No model of this. Whether this is a conceptual approach that works, and whether that becomes operational. In an ideal world, the police would use handhelds, pop the information, and get the number back, or at least a forecast back. It's very doable. I've got this stuff like this running in other criminal justice agencies. Philly PD doesn't have the IT skills to do that yet. But also, it's premature. This has got to be replicated in other samples um, with tuned approaches, maybe a little different. So, what's the summary of this? Okay. No matter how you define it, mass violence is rare. As I said, there's many definitions for it. The existing data is terribly inadequate. One thing we learned at the conference last week was that almost everybody is using existing administrative data sets, like the Uniform Crime Reports, things like that, that are collected for other purposes. We are at an advantage for our analysis because we collect our own data designed with instruments that we design uh, for purposes of trying to count uh, Characterize risk. It turns out you're really limited if you only have access to data that's administrative data collected for other purposes. Prediction in this case for mass violence is very accurate and very trivial, but it sets up substantial challenges. Uh, we're not in the explanation business, we're in the prediction business. I am not claiming that any of those risk factors that are associated with risk, if you manipulated them in fact, do that, they would change anything. There's no causal story here. It sort of makes sense that some of them are causal, and they sort of make sense with past research, but there's no model, and there's no experiment, there's no causality. We are not explaining why these guys reoffend. Although, as I keep saying, you can't help but sort of be pulled into that sort of thinking. But be real clear, there's no model there. The standard statistical tools don't work. Even boosting doesn't work. It gives us a nice function for survivability, fitness. But with only a couple of percent improvement possible, we can't sort out what predictors are going to make that difference. So it stumbles. And that, I get these surprised me a little bit. Um, we certainly need better data, new data. And I gave you an example of what we did here. And I really do think for rare events, we need new methods. Models won't work. Standard forecasting tools won't work. Maybe, I underscore maybe, uh, these genetic algorithms can help. We've illustrated with injuries for IPV. Be real clear, that's not mass violence as defined by law enforcement, which requires deaths. So there is a question about whether what we're finding for injuries for IPV victims tells us much about mass violence. Um, we're starting to work with some folks about getting some data on uh, school kids um, with their shootings, but that's that's sort of clean our eye at this point. And the other thing is, uh, yes, they're real bad guys, and they're located at the tails of these distributions. And tails of all distributions are notoriously hard to study because there's not much data out there. And no matter how you slice it and dice it, no matter how powerful your tools, you're still at the tails of the distribution. Just the data out there are pretty sparse. Where does this get you? Um, I've been doing risk assessment for a long time, and the, um, the peasants have been after me with pitchforks and torches for much of that time. 
The reason in part is that these algorithms and these approaches are criticized for being biased and unfair. Anybody want to take that on? I'm delighted to do it because I've been doing it for a while and there are good answers. It's not what you think. But nevertheless, these kinds of tools generate a lot of strong feelings, even if it's not about bias. There seems to be a gut revulsion to instead of having a biased judge make a decision, have an algorithm that might be biased make a decision. They'd rather have the biased judge or the biased police officer. So even if the facts of how this performs are actually beneficial, there's some problem with allocating sort of confidence to an algorithm to make these decisions. It's just that in passing, it's always struck me as strange. Virtually all of you have flown probably cross country. You probably didn't know it, but most of that trip was on autopilot. An algorithm had your life in its hands, nobody seemed worried about it. Of course, the recent Boeing example may be a concerned. But even then, talk about rare events. So there's a lot going on here. I'm happy to talk about besides the narrow content that I've covered. Otherwise, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. So in, in the data you you had like five percent of their events with like um, injuries mm -hmm. and like twenty percent or something like that was like people real family, right? Mm -hmm. Can't you also use that data? Like that twenty percent? Thinking that there is some sort of like laughing part to the things. Well, um, as a law enforcement matter, you cannot be reported for injuring someone unless the police get there first and see if there's been domestic violence. So this is a subset of those. And uh, as I said, there's fundamental differences on whether a weapon is present. You'll have no injuries if the, if the offender has lays a block on the table and says you won't argue. No one argues that, there's no injuries. So the, the unfolding the ideology of the events is quite different. No, I don't want to use those others. So, so I've been thinking about this. You know, it's funny. I, uh, I was at dinner the other night with Michelle, among others, and we were talking, or somebody mentioned something, I don't know, about school shootings. Uh -huh. And I was saying, you know, we were all going off to the PAA. I had never been to Austin, Texas before, but, you know, I always remember, I can't even remember the guy's name. I think it was Charles Whitman, right? The guy who went up on that tower in 1966 or right. something like that. That is, in some sense, there was a, a first incident. I, mean, I don't know whether they're no, going it goes back. Right. I mean, people had blown up schoolhouses in Michigan and the dynamite and then you think of the civil rights movement burning down the churches. I mean, yeah. Right, well no, but for certain okay, so that's what I'm actually getting yeah. to is classes of events. So I, I realize when you're working with the police, they've got one set of questions, and I'm not challenging that. But again, just another little thread yeah. going back to years ago we had a postdoc in George Bornstadt's measurement program who was working on, you know, back in the, those days when there were still airline hijackings. And so, you know, he was, they were rare events, but, but you know, in sort of standard time series stuff, didn't pick it up, but he had some more complicated thing. And so, you know, some of the events sort of, yeah, they're all of a type, and they're, I mean, you know, if you sort of say this many deaths, yeah. or it happened in a school, or it happened in education, right. But people take on different things. You decide to drive trucks through people. Yep. You, and then they start to cluster. You know, there's a lot of imitation. There's, in other words, there's some other um, structure in the data that exists if you look at them as time series and not as, you know, kind of random, uncorrelated events. Or is that false? Well, it's, it, there is some evidence, but it's less true than you think. Okay. We were looking, again, this is not my research, um, yeah. a number of folks were looking at just that question, and they were taking things back to the 1950s. Um, and um, what they found, and boy, this is real kind of, if you look at the time series of events of the number of deaths, it's pretty flat until about 1995. And the number of events remains flat, but the number of fatalities increases. And the question is why? And I think, and this is where it gets real speculative. On one hand, um, the availability of semi-automatic weapons makes a difference, but they were available in the 50s and 60s when we had semi-automatics in Vietnam. 
So that isn't the story. And nobody knows, but a lot of folks there, psychologists, were talking about the apparent need for fame. That, um, okay, this kid went in and shot up 20 kids in high school. I can top that. I'm going to be more famous than his. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be all over social media. I'm going to shoot 30. And so how do we know this? Well, it turns out that a lot of the perpetrators leave a long trail of social media saying outrageous things. I mean, your lawyer would go nuts because you pretty much say, I'm pissed off, here's what I'm going to do, and here's when I'm going to do it, and I'm going to use these weapons, I'll see you in a week, and then I'll be on the front page of the newspaper, my name will be all over the news, and I'll have, I don't know, 10,000 people, 100,000 people, because um, by the way, often they record what they do with body cameras. Um, I'm going to be famous. So that's the only recent thing which makes explain the increase in deaths, except maybe greater availability of automatic weapons. But the number of incidents hasn't really changed. Yeah, it's, um, I'm trying to understand the, where this fits. In the, uh, you know, New Zealand had a mass shooting, and in two weeks, they restricted access to uh, semi-automatic weapons you know, in, the, in the spirit of trying to prevent. Now, is this about preventing if it's about preventing access to guns, which should be the main variable, you know, it's not in the mod. Now, I do see you mentioned that this is to replace judges' discretion or police well, discretion. Well, in this particular application. Is that the, the objective of here? Because uh, as, a prevent, as a preventive thing, I don't quite see. Okay, two different issues. One is mass shootings. I'll get back to it. This is a different. This says I have. Um, a bunch of folks coming through for arraignment after an arrest. What do I do? Do I release them or do I detain them? And what's required is the consideration not only of the risk of the person not returning to court in order, but also killing the crime. That's what I'm focusing on. Helping police and magistrates make more informed decisions in domestic violence. Because as you know, it's a revolving door. They arrest them, they bring them in, they go home that night, and off they go again. So that's what my data are about. On the question of what to do, and it's going to surprise you, the consensus of the group was the best thing to do is after the shooting. There has been, I'll tell you a story about Aurora, where there was a, um, uh, there was a mass shooting in the theater, and it just turned out that the theater was within a couple blocks of the police department. And within a matter of two minutes, literally, there were officers at the scene, including one, a sergeant, who was also trained as a paramedic. And took over, did effectively triage, and he knew where the hospitals were, he said, you're going to this hospital, you're going to this hospital, and it was at night, so the roads were empty, and people were getting to the hospital 10 or 15 minutes after being shot. Every single one of them lived. If they had been in another part of Aurora, most of them would have died. And the lessons that's coming out of mass shootings is that we save lives by doing good medical care at trauma centers quickly. And the policy question is, how do we set that up? And there's now in several different locales the same story. In Philadelphia, on a related matter, the police, um, when there's a shooting, police come to the scene of the shooting, they no longer call paramedics. Um, they basically take the victim, put them in the police car, and drive to the nearest trauma center. And there's actually a couple of published papers saying it saves lives. When you're, when you're bleeding to death, um, you put tourniquets on and stuff, there's only so much you can do. 15 or 20 minutes is the and so the consensus, one of the consensus out of this two-day session was the best thing you can do about mass shootings is what happens after the shooting occurs because we know what to do and we can make improvements. Trying to prevent is tougher. Uh, again, how do you connect this with access to guns? Uh, okay. Uh, well, there's research on that too. Glad you're asking. Um, one of the big questions in the sort of folks who study guns and gun reform is exactly that question. We've had a number of legislative attempts to ban assault weapons and so on. The problem with banning assault weapons is it's irrelevant because assault weapons only eliminate one form of automatic, a semi-automatic rifle. I kill as many people without uh, an assault weapon that's semi-automatic. Um, so it's not clear what you eliminate from the bag of features. The one thing that seems to make a difference is you ban magazines that hold more than 10 shots. 
large for that cause. That seems to reduce deaths, but everything else doesn't seem to. Part of the problem is the society is saturated with guns. So even if today you and I said, no more assault weapons, it would be a decade or more before we sort of reduce the number. What New Zealand is doing is they're offering basically bounties if you turn in your weapons. And I have no idea how successful that will be. We tried that in the United States, it wasn't very successful. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about replicability and, and, and the famous consequences of this? These results are based on one data set in Philadelphia. You said it should be replicated, but you know, I probably the results won't be the same if you do this in LA or Washington. No. Or, and then, I mean, would you, would you expect your tool, if you want to sell your tool, would that tool be the same for everywhere? Would it have to be city specific? And what kind of fairness consequences would that be? Okay, a couple of, a couple of, you've raised two different issues, at least two. Um, I've always advocated that all these machine learning tools have to be local for just the reasons you say. So I, not only local for the geography, but for the decision. So I have an algorithm for arraignments. I have another algorithm for parole releases. Why? Parole release involves folks who have served time in prison. They're older, they're different. In the case of arraignments, you haven't even been convicted of a crime yet, let alone tried. So the mix of offenders is different, and the rules that apply are different. So you need different algorithms for different decisions in different locales. And there's not enough of it done yet for me to answer your question about how generalizable this is. I'm working with the uh, Pennsylvania Commission on Sentencing. We're trying to develop a, a sentencing algorithm for judges, which is required by statute by the way, uh, for the whole state. And um, I don't know if we can do it. I mean, is Harrisburg the same as Philadelphia? What about Lancaster? I don't know. So, fairness is a whole other ballgame, um, and it's really complicated um, because there are legal and ethical issues, and there are a host of technical issues. Um, a lot of people, a lot of computer scientists working on it, I work with some of them here. There are seven or eight different definitions of fairness, all properly justified if they make sense. You can prove that you can't have them all, they're incompatible. So it boils down to trade-offs. How much, and there's also trade-offs in accuracy. 10% increase in this kind of fairness, 5% decrease in another kind of fairness. It's not for me to decide, not for you to decide, it's for the stakeholders to decide. And that hasn't happened yet. And here in Philadelphia, uh, it's a kind of war of all against all, trying to get people to have that discussion. But one thing I can tell you, and this is um, this always upsets people, but it's worth bringing up here too. Um, I developed some tools that I can show you that the algorithm is absolutely fair for blacks, whites, men, and women. It has the same accuracy for both. That's no problem. The problem is that when you um, actually compute risk, African Americans and males are computed at much higher risk. Is that fair? Let's focus on men for a second. The vast majority of violent crimes in this country are committed by men. That's true not just this country, but around the world, it's true historically. If my algorithm didn't predict on the average that men were higher risk, you would say, your algorithm's no good. You're right. If you look at places like Philadelphia, take an example, 300 or so homicides last year. Virtually all the victims are African American. 300 African-American victims. Virtually all the perpetrators are African-American. 150 school kids were shot last year. That's more than all the mass shootings in the United States. By the way, that's true of every major, every major metropolitan area. The vast majority of those kids were shot. Some of them died, some of them in wheelchairs, some of them will never turn to recover. The vast majority of them were African-American and they were shot by African-Americans. If my algorithm doesn't predict that, what I'm doing is I'm being unfair to the victims. And that just is hard for people to accept. But if you look at the major metropolitan areas, men are the black ones. Okay. So that's the best answer I can give you. And by the way, that doesn't go down so well. And, and if you talk, as I have over the years, to police here in Philadelphia, Ramsey, who's African American, Ross, who's African American current, and they will tell you that biggest crime problem in Philadelphia is black on black crime, and they're African American, and that's the way they focus their, their resources, and they don't do a very good job because we have all these homicides still. 
Why that is is for sociologists to figure out. I'm not trying to explain anything about why that occurs. I'm just saying it's a factual matter. That's where the violence is. Richard. Thank you.